Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. I hope you guys got a chance to check out the remake of Dune by Denis Villeneuve. If you like this follow-up to a Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049, you'll probably enjoy this film as well. Once again, the director shows a passion and understanding for the source material, but improves on the original film in many ways. Of course, the original Dune from 1984 was derided by critics on release because it truly was a strange and very campy film. One gets a sense that it came out too early, at a time when cinema technology was still relatively primitive. Clearly, technology in 2021 has advanced greatly, and the Dune franchise looks better than ever. But that 1984 film adaptation of Dune was not actually the first attempt to bring this famous novel to the big screens. In the 1970s, avant-garde filmmaker Alejandro Jodorowsky attempted to bring Frank Herbert's Dune to the big screen. He would pitch a storyboard full of nightmarish art from H.R. Geiger. That would go on to inspire many future directors and creators in Hollywood, especially Ridley Scott and his Alien franchise. A young and impressionable George Lucas also picked up a copy of Frank Herbert's Dune. It's very clear that Paul Atreides, the main character in Dune, is the inspiration behind Luke Skywalker. Both individuals are young princes of sorts with magical superpowers, who happen to also be on a desert planet. You also have the Tusken Raiders, who aren't exactly the best analog for Freeman, but hey, at least they both wear those environmental suits to keep the moisture on their bodies from evaporating. While on the subject of moisture, what is up with all of these deserts in science fiction? That's kind of what I want to talk about today. Why is Dune centrally located on Arrakis? Why does the first half of the first Star Wars film take place on Tatooine? And why is Tatooine the most revisited planet in all Star Wars lore, both in film and TV? Why was the sequel Star Wars trilogy also rebooted on a similar desert planet of Jakku? Why did Rogue One have a desert planet called Jeddah? Similar deserts are also a part of many other famous sci-fi franchises, including Alien, Stargate, John Carter, Mars. The quick and short answer, at least in the early days of Hollywood before we had CGI everything or these crazy 360 degree screens that just projected alien worlds, was that there were technical limitations when it came to creating science fiction. Now, obviously, John Hubert didn't run into these limitations when he was writing a novel, because novels rely on people's imaginations and not huge sci-fi budgets. But George Lucas was faced with the huge challenge of creating a sci-fi world for the big screen. More importantly, this young and talented filmmaker had a crazy idea for an epic space opera with a pretty small budget. And because of the technological limitations at the time, shooting on location was probably going to be necessary. And when trying to create an alien world here on Earth, you have to look at the most extreme biomes, basically where humans don't live. And that's because these kind of biomes are not oftentimes seen by the average person. And because they're not familiar with it, it might as well be an alien world. And on Earth, one of the most extreme biomes is definitely the desert, specifically the ones in Tunisia in the Sahara Desert, where mountains of sand move in giant dunes. Another extreme biome on Earth is jungles or rainforests, and in an early draft of Star Wars, it wasn't Luke Skywalker on the desert planet of Tatooine, it was the young warrior Anakin Starkiller who lived on the fourth moon of a planet known as Utapu, which was a jungle planet. For those hardcore Star Wars fans out there, you probably know that Utapu would eventually become a real Star Wars planet and a jungle world. But at the time, Utapu was scratched from the plan after producer Gary Kurtz traveled to the Philippines to do some location scouting in the jungles there and found the conditions to be way too difficult to actually film in. Not that the Sahara Desert would be that much better, you would imagine, but anyway. Soon they started scouting for locations in Morocco and Tunisia, and they fell in love with the desert there. Lucas especially loved an interesting town known as Matmata, home to the Hotel Sidi Driss, which showcases Berber troglodyte cave homes, which of course becomes the Lars homestead on Tatooine. We have to remember at the time in the 1960s and 70s, travel was far less extensive and much more difficult than it was today. Now, no matter where you go in the world, outside of a few isolated nations like North Korea and uh, Iran, you basically see the same thing everywhere. When you step out of the airport, there will be a McDonald's, a Starbucks, and movie posters showcasing Marvel films and Liam Neeson saving children from human trafficking. Thank you, Liam, you patron saint of lost children's you. America's soft power is strong, but it also makes everything quite similar and bland. But back then, the Great Sahara Desert would have been seen as a much more exotic location to go. It wouldn't have been overdone on Instagram by vloggers, and it certainly was not something the average person could easily travel to. Even less explored were the various cultures that existed in these kind of areas. 
And so it was easy for George Lucas to borrow some elements from Berber and Bedouin culture to create his own alien species and cultures like the Tusken Raiders, a nomadic desert-faring species who used essentially real-world Jazale long-barreled muskets commonly used by Pashtun tribesmen against the Brits during the Anglo-Afghan Wars. And so one of the major reasons why desert planets are so common in science fiction is the fact that for a low-budget producer, it gives you tons of production value for essentially free. On top of that, you have a lot of interesting desert cultures and way of life that can seem very exotic to the viewers. When Frank Herbert sat down and began writing his magnum opus, Dune, he drew inspiration from multiple sources and ultimately decided to do a desert story because of his own experiences in life and the authors and stories he loved growing up. As a young man, Herbert loved reading the pulpy John Carter of Mars books, and originally he had played around with the idea of setting Dune on Mars and turning his novel into a more adult version of the more pulpy original source. Which really does remind me of George Lucas's fascination with Flash Gordon and how he originally tried to buy the rights for bringing Flash Gordon to the big screen, but was rejected, and so he was forced to create Star Wars instead. It should also be mentioned that Paul Atreides, the protagonist of Dune, is very similar to T.E. Lawrence, a real-life British soldier who basically united various Bedouin tribes against the Ottoman Empire during World War I. Frank Herbert also worked as a journalist in the late 50s. He was assigned to cover a U.S. governmental program that was designed to stabilize the sand dunes near Oregon. While there, he learned quite a lot about desertification and how the Dust Bowl in the 30s affected local farming. It was during this time that Herbert gained a huge appreciation and awe for the power of the desert and what a large threat it could be to all life. This is one of the key elements that makes Arrakis and also Tatooine and many other desert planets such a good setting for science fiction. To truly move the audience from Earth to an exotic planet, it not only has to visibly look strange and different, the very act of being human on such a fictional world should be challenging as well. Whether that's done by making the air toxic or by making moisture so rare that it needs to be drawn out through the air through condensation machines doesn't really matter. The end goal is to create a harsh and unsurvivable world. This discomfort really helps audiences focus in on the characters and the various situations they're going through. It's very similar to why audiences like survival movies or disaster movies. Science fiction, especially at the time, was a relatively niche genre. And many authors and creators of science fiction at this time, like Frank Herbert, did so in the name of philosophy and thought exercises, because science fiction is essentially one big what-if scenario. Herbert also liked to dabble in philocybin, which most likely inspired the spice melange resource found on the world of Arrakis. But more importantly, such psychedelic compounds tend to open the mind to creativity, alternate thinking, and experimentation, which oftentimes leads to very unique and innovative world building and future possibilities. Now, Herbert sculpted the world of Arrakis not only for audiences, but also for himself. His time in Oregon amongst the dunes opened up a lane of creativity that otherwise would have remained unexplored. Herbert developed a fascination for sand and how it moved like liquid in a giant ocean. He also had great interest in animals and species that could survive in such a harsh environment. This is where he comes up with the idea for the Freemen, who wear special water-preserving suits in order to survive uh, for long periods of time in the desert. Another one of the major themes in the first part of Dune that takes place on Arrakis is the idea that the noble houses are unwilling to terraform the planet because of the rich spices one can find in the sand, despite the fact that turning the planet green would significantly improve the lives of all of the Freeman people. This is where we begin to see him play with these elements of greed and dystopia. As you all know, greed and dystopia are common comorbidities in the science fiction genre. And that's because humans tend to always fear the unknown, and that includes the future. And those who have the time, the luxurious time to look at the future constantly, most likely focus quite a lot on the dangers of the present as well. Whether it's Herbert's fascination with desertification or George Lucas's opposition to the Vietnam War and Richard Nixon's political movement, one does not write science fiction without an opinion of the world around them and which course they think society is going towards. The Desert Planet, unfortunately, is popular in science fiction because it represents the graveyard and future of humanity, or at least some other race that reached its height and then collapsed. Take a look at the Book of Eli, The Road, or Mad Max. The desert is bleak and depressing. It consumes humanity and is designed to give us context about our role in the galaxy and on our planet. It makes humans in this modern society full of towering skyscrapers and miracle medicines and technology feel small and vulnerable in comparison. That is one of the things that the original Dune does quite well, and that is create this sense of massive scale, whether it's the space-bending ships 
or the gigantic sandworms, or the massive armies and ships utilized by the various houses. The desert planet serves as a warning to audiences to appreciate what we have here on Earth today. It reminds us that in the post-apocalyptic dunes, we are all equals. So there you have it guys, those are some of the reasons why I believe many science fiction films take place on desert planets. Uh, as you can tell, there's a lot of production value with these type of worlds, and also uh, there's a natural sense of adversity on desert worlds that really helps make the stories more impactful and interesting to follow. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. My name is Alan reminding you that life is a movie, and you are the protagonist.